would you please turn to Ephesians and chapter 6. That's midway through the second half of the Bible, the New Testament. <clears throat> Ephesians and chapter 6. Some preachers have a focus on a sermon series, and so they don't necessarily take into account uh, a traditional holiday. I don't know, for some reason through the years, I felt compelled when we come to a special day like this uh, to often bring a sermon in accord with the uh, uh, idea or the event that is being celebrated. Father's Day, every year, when Father's Day rolls around, there are a few particular thoughts that come to my mind. Uh, one is, I remember a comic from Peanuts. That's where I get most of my sermon material. It's from the really heavy theological sources. And so Linus, the little guy in the cartoon, says to the other little guy, Charlie Brown, he said, Charlie Brown, what are you going to do for your dad for Father's Day? He said, well, first, I'm going to have you, to the, have you take me to the park and push me on the swing. He said, then I'm going to have you take me to the zoo. He said, then I'm going to have you take me for an ice cream cone. He said, by the end of the day, he's going to really know he's a father. <laughs> and uh, I think there's a, a good point to that. Secondly, on the reverse side of emotion, I remember a coworker in ministry who told me about a family reunion that he attended out in California, and his elderly father was there. And he said that he was sharing the experience with me. He said, you know, my dad said to me something that really touched me. I said, well, what did he say to you? He said, my dad told me that he loved me. He said, you know, all the years I grew up, I don't ever remember my dad telling me that he loved me. And so it was bittersweet. He was so thankful that his dad had said that to him. But he was also sorry that it had taken years to be able to hear it. When I think of Father's Day, I think of my dad. And, you know, he's a great Christian. He's a great preacher. He's a great prayer warrior. He's a great soul winner. He's a great man of faith. He's a great giver. But I'll tell you what, he's a great dad. And he's not a great dad so much because he's done everything perfectly, but he's a great dad because my journey has zigzagged through the years, and my dad has always been there for me. Even when he didn't agree with me, he never did anything but love and support me. And so, and thankfully, he's still with us, still active in ministry. And uh, so I've had the privilege of having him all of my life. And I'm grateful for that. And sometimes I feel like he's a good representative of the Heavenly Father. And each Father's Day, in a prayerful way, I always try to wish our Heavenly Father a happy Father's Day. Jesus taught us to pray, our Father who is in heaven. With that in mind, in Ephesians chapter 6, I want to draw your attention to one verse. And here the Apostle Paul writes to the Ephesian Christians in the church family of there at Ephesus, and he says, Fathers, in verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. There are numerous texts in God's Word about fatherhood. And for some reason, this one kept coming to me. And I wrestled with it a little bit because I said, we don't have that many dads in our congregation that are dealing with younger children still at home. But the more I thought about it, I thought, you know what, maybe there's one dad that'll attend today or one dad that hears our ministry online that may need this verse. Secondly, I thought, you know what? Even older dads with older kids can use this verse. 
And finally, I thought, really, in relationships, we all need this verse. And so, consequently, I felt glad to share some thoughts regarding Ephesians 6 and verse 4. Notice, first of all, it says fathers. And if you go to the Greek from which the English is translated, it is not the word parent. It is specifically the word father or fathers. And two thoughts with that as I studied on this. The first is that Paul may well have been directed by the Holy Spirit to write particularly to fathers about how they treat their kids because in the Roman and affected societies of that day by the Roman Empire, the dad was truly the head of the home to the point that actually he could have a child abandoned, sold into slavery, or even killed if he chose to. And so with that in mind, Paul addresses fathers. Along with that, one commentator suggested, and I'm not sure I agree with this, but he said, you know, sometimes a child is more comforted by mom than they are by dad. Because sometimes dad can be a little tough. Now, I know the dads in our church, you're all marshmallows. You're all cream puffs. But in case there's a dad who maybe is a little overbearing, fathers. And then it says, do not provoke your children to anger. And it's interesting. If you again go to the Greek text from which the English is translated, the words provoke and anger are actually wrapped up in one word. In other words, don't make your kids mad. Now let's be honest. Most fathers or parents have had their kids get mad at one time or another because they were not allowed to do something they wanted to do. And they were told, I hate you. Momentary. Or they've been corrected for something they weren't supposed to do. And that might make them mad. But the theme really here in the original word is the idea, don't do something so drastic that it drives your child to anger. Or don't do something so often that it exasperates them and they get mad. Noah, would you come to the front, please? Noah has agreed to help me illustrate this point. Hey, Noah, how you doing? Good, man. Good to see you, old bud. You're awesome. What's that? Oh, you don't like that, huh? <laughs> Too bad. I like it, man. That's cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, I kind of <laughs> Okay, if you feel that way about it, go ahead, man. Just why'd you even come to church today? Stop it. Oh, you start to get mad. Thank you, sir. How about a hand for Noah? All right. I see a future in the movies right there. <laughs> Do you get the point? Yes. You keep pushing a child. And they get to a point. They get angry. They may even strike back or rebel or withdraw or do something drastic themselves. What are some of the ways that we can be warned about provoking our children to anger? Well, one way, as I meditated on these and studied on them, is teasing. You know, you can tease somebody. You think it's funny. Others think it's funny. But maybe to the one being teased, it's not funny. Sometimes it's a nickname that's really concentrating on some aspect of their life that they may not be thrilled about. Or just, you know, constantly not being serious with them teasing. Let me give you an illustration that convicted my own heart. I have a sister who is as petite as a girl could be. But growing up, she was a little bit on the stocky side. And she had shirts that cut off at the sleeves. And big brother, I would tease her about those arms. I said, well, you're our little Denver Bronco linebacker. 
One day as an adult, I said, you know, I don't know why we were on vacation. I said, aren't you hot in those sleeves? And she said, Tim, I never wear a sleeveless shirt. I said, why? She said, because growing up, you always teased me about my heart. Boy, you talk about somebody that needed to go to the altar and get right. And see, it made me realize that something I probably thought was funny, maybe even got some others to laugh about, it wasn't funny to her. So I'd be careful to tease her. Another thing can be neglect. Just the dad who, and they may even be in the home, but they never really pay attention. They never really show up. You ever hear that song, Cat in the Cradle? And the dad is always too busy until the son grows up and when the dad wants to see him, the son's too busy. He said, you know what? He always said he wanted to be like me. Now he is. I have a dear friend and her mother is quite elderly and begins to reflect on some stories of the past, even confusion sometimes, but she'll consistently tell a story of how when she played basketball as a girl, her dad in North Carolina, who didn't have a car, would drive a team of horses on a wagon to see every basketball game. See, that's one story she's never forgotten. So dads, just show up. It may not even be your thing, but you're there to support. And then there can be sad, verbal, or physical, or even sexual abuse. God forbid. But children do get treated that way. How awful. And along with that, a great point was made by a Bible teacher, and I really was impressed by this. He said, one of the negatives can be that you don't realize that times have changed. And they told the story of a little girl who was wanting to do something, and her mother said, listen, when I was a little kid like you, they didn't allow us to do that. And the little girl said, mother, you were then, I'm now. And you know what? God's principles do not change. But lots of methods, lots of activities do change. And sometimes a parent needs to catch up with the times, not keep their child stuck in their place. I thought that was very, very important. And so these are some of the ways we can be challenged not to forgive. There's one final one, and it's a parent who is overly strict, overly insistent on you're going to work hard, you're going to toe the mark. Let me tell you something. How many of you toe the mark in here 100%? That's exactly what I find. Don't we all need a little mercy? Don't we all need a little grace? Let's not forget our kids need it. And sometimes the person who is trying to be the most religious will drive their child away from religion. Because they are overly strict. In fact, one Bible teacher in his study on this passage said, I believe there is a personal note here from the Apostle Paul. He said, I believe very possibly that he grew up in a very strict religious home. Maybe there was lots of religion, but there wasn't much display of affection. Ouch. Don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up. Now, I want to illustrate that this morning, if I may. And I did not tell her, so she's going to be shocked. But Connie... Would you come up here, please? <laughs> no, Connie, stay right there. Now, some people see that as, you know, bring. No, that's not the idea of the word bring. Here's the word bring. Connie, let me help you. Take my own. Let's walk together. Thank you, Connie. Let me help you back to your seat. <laughs> you know what the word bring really means? 
It's not the Father who says, do this. It's the Father who says, let me help you do this. That's the difference. It's not just the exhortation, do it or don't do it. It's the example that says, this is the way we do it. This is the way we don't do it. Bring your children up in the instruction and the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Those two words, interestingly, are very similar, but they have this difference. The first word, discipline, or some translate instruction, the old King James translates it nurture. It's really the idea of making them know what the rules are. Here's what God wants us to do. Here's what God doesn't want us to do. And then the other word, the instruction, is really the idea of the reminder of the rules. You see, I don't know about you, but once in a while I forget the rules, and I need to be reminded. Do you ever play table games at home? And you know, you'll read the rules and start to play the game, and then all of a sudden you want to make a move or take a card, <laughs> and so it's, hey, that's not in the rules. Read the rules. <laughs> I'm not accusing you of cheating. Please understand. Right? I'm just saying that you get the idea. There are God's rules. And then a father also has the responsibility to lovingly keep his children reminded about God's rules. I love the passage in Deuteronomy in the Old Testament when God said, here's what I want you to do with your kids. He said, when you walk with them, I want you to talk about me. He said, when you sit in your house, I want you to talk about me. When you go to bed at night, I want you to talk about me. When you get up in the morning, I want you to talk about me. He said, I want you to write some of my scripture on the tent flap so when they open the door, they see the scripture. He said, I want you to put it on a headband so when they're playing with each other, they see the scripture. In other words, God said, I want it to be just not a matter that I gave you the Ten Commandments and the writings of Moses. He said, I want you to be consistently reminded about what they are. That's the idea of not just bringing the family to church, but living for the Lord at home as well. That's the idea. And I conclude with this thought. It says, in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, a good dad might say to a child, do you know what to do in case of an emergency? A good dad might say to a child who's beginning to drive or has gotten a car, do you know how to take care of the oil and the tires and so on? A good dad might say, do you understand how to use a checkbook or bank online or how to use a credit card responsibly? A good dad might say, how's it going in school? Is there anything your mother can help you with? <laughs> a good dad might say, how are you feeling? A Bible good dad says, do you know the Lord? Jeremiah 31, verses 33 and 34 says, there's coming a day when you won't have to say to anybody, know the Lord. Because they're all going to know the Lord. But we're not there to that day yet. And so every dad ought to have the burden to say, I want my kids to know the Lord. As I drive on uh, uh, 376 West out toward the airport, there's a business that has these words on a sign. It says, do you know Jesus? And I thought, you know, that's a great thought. And what do we really mean? Well, it's not like I can go up and shake Jesus' hand. But what I can have is just like with some folks who I've never seen with my eyeball, but I've communicated with them on the phone or through a text or an email, and we've gotten to know each other. Do you know Jesus can mean, do you believe in him that he exists and that he died for you and rose again? 
Do you know Jesus in the sense you've trusted him to save your soul to eternal life in God's heaven? Do you know Jesus in the sense you want to learn who he is, what he's like? Do you know Jesus in that you want to be a follower and try to do what he's laid out for us to do in the Bible? Do you know Jesus that really he's not just some aspect of our life on Sundays, but he's an important part of our life every day? Do you know Jesus? And then someday, if you do, you will get to see him. And that's the joy. Dads, don't make your kids mad by some drastic action or a constant pushing until they can't take it anymore. But through example, as well as exhortation. Let them know what God's rules are. And remind them, let's live for the Lord. And by the way, I want you to know things that are important for this life as a good dad. But most important, I want you to know, there's eternal life. So I want you to know, I want you to know that you know the Lord. My dad, as Gretchen said, took me to church. At the age of five, I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. I took my children to church. Now as adults, some are following the path, others have chosen at this point not to. But they all know that dad loves them Dad wants them to know the Lord. That's Father's Day. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing a chorus. Father, I adore you. If you're here today and you have yet to know Jesus personally, we'd love to introduce you to him. By faith in his word. You can step out this morning and say, I'd like to know him. Or you can make an appointment with us for a later time to learn about him. If you're here today and you'd like to be baptized or added to this church and you'd like to make that known to us, we'd love to hear that. If you're here today and you just would like someone who can pray for you about whatever's going on in your life, you're welcome to come. We'll have someone pray with you as we sing together. Father, I adore you. Now, there are three verses honoring the entire Trinity. So we're going to start. Father, I adore you. Jesus, I adore you. Spirit, I adore you. And then we'll circle back at the end. Father, I adore you. Let's sing it in worship in response. <laughs> Thank you. 